Can you guys hear anything? Yes, I can hear you. Angela, uh, just give me the thumbs up and I will get started. Yes. Go ahead, Teresa. Okay, okay. Wonderful. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, on behalf of the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable, uh, welcome to the webinar and thanks for joining us um, as part of our Safer Chemistry Challenge Program webinar series. Uh, this is uh, Teresa McGrath speaking. I'm a toxicologist at NSF International in our green chemistry programs, and I'm also involved in the Safer Chemistry Challenge Program as part of their technical advisory committee. Um, and I'm going to be introducing your webinar today. Um, so our webinar is titled, Using the Green Screen to Identify Preferred Materials in HP's Global Supply Chain. And it, it's really aimed to provide you with information and resources that are going to help you advance your own efforts towards safer chemistries. And what it's going to consist of is a introduction uh, to the green screen for safer chemicals by Dr. Lauren Hine of Clean Production Action. And then uh, Corey Robertson of Hewlett Packard will describe Hewlett Packard's experience with using the tool. And um, the green screen is a, a method for comparative chemical hazard assessment that's currently used by a growing number of large manufacturers of products ranging from um, electronics, uh, to apparel and footwear. And HP has really been a leader in using comparative chemical hazard assessments, especially uh, the green screen, to identify safer chemicals, uh, of safer alternatives to chemicals of concern in their global material supply chain, and has really been a success story in, in using these types of tools. Um, and really, the, the, the webinar is. Um, is intended to help advance the goal of the Safer Chemistry Challenge program. Um, and Angela, can you forward to the Safer Chemistry? Thank you. Um, and um, which the goal of the, the program is really to motivate, challenge, assist, and reward companies as you find alternatives to chemicals of concern um, to human health and into the environment. And, and um, for those of you who are not familiar with the program, I, I encourage you to, um, to look into the program and to sign up for the program. It's, it's an excellent um, way to partner with industry, um, states, and uh, nonprofits. And it, the, the program provides you with valuable resources, including technical assistance to help you find safer alternatives, and, and to recognize companies who um, successfully move away from chemicals of concern. Um, so it's an excellent program that can really accelerate opportunities for you to capture um, emerging markets for products with safer chemistries, which are certainly, um, you know, certainly becoming um, more uh, familiar to, to uh, consumers in the marketplace today. And, and overall, of course, it results in a cleaner environment while providing value to your company's bottom line. Uh, so those, those of you who are not already signed up uh, for the challenge program, please do check it out and we'll provide you with additional information at the end of the webinar. All right, so um, let's get moving towards the, the core of the webinar. Oh, um, oh and here's um, uh, just a reminder of additional webinars that will be uh, will be coming up this fall. Um, so please take note of, of the, uh, I think the, the re remaining one is on December 6th um, about the QCAT tool, which is another hazard assessment tool um, that, that can help you in your, in your progress towards choosing safer chemicals. All right, and I just wanted to cover a couple of logistics before we dive into the webinar. Um, you will be on mute. All attendees will be on mute during the webinar, but if you do have questions, we do encourage you to submit those through the submit question option in the toolbar um, that GoToWebinar provides. Um, and if there's time, um, and we do plan on having time at the end of the webinar, um, questions will be, will be answered at, at the end. And we 
really would appreciate your feedback as well on how this webinar will meet your, chemi com your company's program's needs towards moving towards safer chemistries. So at the webinar, you'll receive a survey, and we do appreciate if you would please fill that out and give us some feedback um, so we can improve our future webinars. All right, um, now, now it's time to introduce our webinar for today. Um, our speakers include uh, Lauren Hine from Clean Production Action and Corey Robertson from Hewlett Packard. Uh, I'm going to start with introducing Dr. Lauren Hine, uh, who, is, who is a good friend of mine and a co-director of Clean Production Action. She directs its green screen program and applies green chemistry, green engineering, and multi-stakeholder collaboration and design for the environment to business practices. Lauren serves on the California's Green, Chemist, Green Ribbon Science Panel and works closely with the US EPA's Design for the Environment program to develop uh, criteria for safer chemicals and alternative assessment criteria for hazard evaluation. She co-authored policy principles for the sustainable materials management uh, for OECD and the university textbook, Introduction to Environmental Engineering um, to Integrate Sustainable Design Concepts. She led the development of Clean Ingredients, which she'll be presenting today, which again is a web-based platform for identifying greener chemicals for use in cleaning products. So I'll hand it over now to Dr. Lauren Hine. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, and thank you to the Safer Chemistry Challenge Program uh, for inviting uh, me and Corey. And um, I'm going to just do uh, a brief introduction to the green screen. I tend to uh, pack in a lot of information on slides, but that's in part because our slides will be available on the website. You can download them um, and uh, hopefully uh, use them later. Next, please. Okay, um, Clean Production Action is my organization. It's a non, it's an NGO, nonprofit that works with governments, other NGOs, and industry leaders to advance green chemistry and sustainable materials to facilitate a market transition to a healthy economy, healthy environment, and healthy people. Next, that's our mission. And I'm going to be talking about the green screen for safer chemicals, which, as Teresa said, is a method for comparative Chemical Hazard Assessment, CHA. Um, it builds on the work of the US EPA Design for the Environment Program, their um, alternatives assessment approach. But it also builds on other national and international precedents, such as the OECD testing protocols and GHS, which is the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling of chemicals. Um, it is freely and publicly accessible. You can go to our website and download all of the method documents and the guidance. It's transparent and it's peer-reviewed, and we are committed to continual improvement um, of this. And the green screen, the ch ch uh, chemical hazard assessment, complements other sustainability tools. So it's not intended to be the only tool you use in alternative assessment, it's the, it's the chemical hazard assessment piece of it. So you might use it with eco-design, risk assessment. You might use it in addition to life cycle assessment. You might be a part of eco-labels, et cetera. It's a, just a, one tool in the toolbox. It's, uh, critical but not sufficient for all of sustainability. Next. So uh, this slide. Um, the, the origin of the green screen really uh, came from, um, it, it was, we were asked to uh, look at some flame retardants in television casings and to compare them, and we needed a really robust way to do that. So we built on the US EPA Design for the Environment hazard assessment approach. And DFV at that time was working on partnerships, and this is a picture of the hazard table that came out of the furniture flame retardancy partnership. And DFV did, I think it was about a, I don't know, 800-page document by the time it was done. And all of the information boiled down into this hazard table, which presents a ranking of hazard for each chemical, um, high, medium, or low, in this hazard table. And this was a huge stake in the ground. But people were still left asking, OK, well, how do I know which one's better? None of them look great. Uh, none of them looked horrible. 
at the time, and there was a need for some sort of decision logic. And EPA cannot uh, judge or recommend chemicals. But the green screen provides a decision logic. So building on the DFE, we did make a few tweaks. We added things like flammability, reactivity, um, and a lot of uh, a number of other things that I don't have time to go into. But we built on DFE, added the benchmarking decision logic. Next, please. So there's three steps to doing a green screen assessment. First, you assess and classify the hazards. Then you apply the benchmarks. Then you make informed decisions. Next. Assessing and classifying the hazards. There are 18 hazard endpoints included in the standard green screen method. Um, it's possible to add more. We didn't require certain ecotox studies, such as bird toxicity or worthworm toxicity, because those data are really hard to find. But these are the, the endpoints in the standard set. And you can add more if you have them. Next. Each endpoint, each hazard endpoint, as we call it, comes with a set of criteria. And um, wherever feasible, we build on precedent. So um, for example, this is the, these are the criteria for acute mammalian toxicity. And we lean on the GHS system. So if something is GHS category 1 or 2 by any route of exposure, that would be uh, considered very high for acute mammalian toxicity. Likewise, if it's a GHS category 3 for any route of exposure. Um, those GHS criteria um, can be translated into thresholds. So for example, if the oral LD50 is between 50 and 300 milligrams per kilogram um, based on uh, test methods, then that would uh, mean that the uh, chemical is uh, high for uh, for acute mammalian toxicity. So that's, those, this information can only come from the scientific literature. Um, you can make the classification yourself. Some, uh, some countries do the classifications on chemicals and publish them. But those we call the, um, those are the criteria that need research. There's also, we also make use of lists, hazard lists, whenever we can. So. Um, we, for example, if something has an EU H statement or an EU risk phrase, so if it's an H300 or an R26, then that chemical um, would be very high for acute mammalian toxicity. Or if it's, for example, on the, um, let's see, uh, the EPA uh, extremely hazardous substances list, um, it could be high or very high for acute mammalian toxicity. So the criteria include a, bl a, a blend of thresholds, GHS guidance, and lists, wherever lists are feasible. And we split the lists into authoritative and screening. Um, screening meaning they might be there because they uh, for need further testing, or because um, they're not an authoritative source, and A and B. And B lists. Um, a lists fit nicely into a box like the R26 um, classification. B lists span uh, multiple levels, such as the EPA extremely hazardous substance. So I just wanted to go into a little detail there because it uh, will uh, be important. Next. So this is an example of uh, an excerpt from um, an actual green screen assessment where the profiler summarized what they found in the literature for this chemical 2-ethyl-1-hexanol. And this assessment is actually on our website. You can download the full green screen assessment. And so you can see what they did is they summarized um, all the literature that they found, and then they made a classification for acute mammalian toxicity based on their research in the literature, and, um, and, and may called it a moderate. Next. So here is another excerpt from that green screen assessment. You can see that they put um, the moderate, where it says AT under group 2 uh, human. Um, it says AT at, 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 I think it's a 6, 1 over. So you can see they put in the value for acute mammalian toxicity into that um, box. And this is called the hazard table. So your goal is to populate this hazard table. Um, and where it says, 
where the letters are bold, that means it's based on measured data. Where the letters are italic, that means it's based on estimated data or models. And where it says DG, that means there's a data gap, which means um, there, no matter where the person looked or even if they modeled a result, they could not fill that um, data gap. But it doesn't mean they didn't look for data. They meant they looked everywhere and didn't find it. Next. So the next step, after you have filled out your hazard table, the next step is to apply the benchmarks. Next. And um, there are four uh, levels to the benchmark system. And you start at the bottom with the benchmark one. And there are five uh, if statements there. And if any of those if statements are true, then that chemical is a benchmark one. If none of them are true, then you move up to benchmark two, and you test it again to see if any of those statements are true. And then, if not, move up to benchmark three, et cetera. And um, if, uh, if the, the benchmark one is designed to align with regulatory drivers, so the definition of a benchmark one is equivalent to the definition of a substance of very high concern under REACH, and um, the types of chemicals that typically are targeted as chemicals of concern in the US and Canada. So we chose, this is the subjective piece of the green screen. Um, that we think the hazard classification is pretty objective, because we can base it in GHS and other sources. But this is where we apply some values. And the values we chose to apply are um, aligning with regulatory drivers. Um, it doesn't mean that um, you know you could have a benchmark three chemical that has that's irritating to the eye. That doesn't mean you should put it into an eye wash. You still have to use common sense. You still have to make your own risk management decisions. But this is the value, and there's and there's value in aligning with regulatory drivers because that creates a business driver. Next slide. So if you could just kind of punch through this, Angela, it'd be great. So. What you do is you go through every question here. If you look at that hazard table for an imaginary solvent, um, you would look at, say, the state endpoints, P and B. And you see that they're both low. So you could say, is it a PBT? Is it high or higher for P, higher, higher for B? Um, and then you know, very high T. And you'd have to say no, because it's low for both P and B. Same with B. That's not true. Same with C. That's not true. Same with C. That's not true. And I, there's one more. Um, is it high for T in the group one human category over on the left? And the answer is no. So this chemical, one more, is not a benchmark one. So if you go to the next one, same thing. Is it a benchmark two? Um, it doesn't have any persistence or bioaccumulation potential. So none of um, the first four are true. But it is moderate toxicity for um, ecotox um, or the group two or two star humans. You can see that it's moderate for neurotox, and it's even high for systemic tox. So um, two of those are true in this case. So this chemical, um, and as I said before, only one needs to be true to call it a benchmark two. But in this case, two, two things would make it a benchmark two chemical. So you would call this chemical benchmark two. Uh, next. The last step here is the uh, make informed decisions. Um, and this is, how do you now use this information? Next. Um, there's, we've been observing um, a number of ways that the green screen has been applied. Uh, it's been applied in materials procurement to identify uh, safer chemicals and chemicals of concern as well. Um, in product development, looking at new formulations and also for brand new chemicals that have been developed. We've seen it built into corporate policies. We're seeing it um, starting to be cited in state regulations. And we're seeing it as um, now being uh, integrated into standard scorecards and eco-labels. And our goal as a nonprofit is to make this you know, method you know, freely available and uh, a useful tool for everybody in an open, transparent way. So we can shift, um, as you can see in that, uh, shifting the bell curve of hazard of chemicals toward the green end. Next. 
I'm not going to say much here because Corey's going to tell you in detail about uh, HP uses the green screen, but they're the world's leading practitioner and they use it for identifying safer alternatives. Next. Um, it's used in product development, as I mentioned, for new molecules, but also formulators and compounders can use it to identify safer ingredients. For example, Poly1 um, engaged with green screen via, because of their relationship with Hewlett Packard, and they're committed to using, uh, developing cleaner, greener products. Um, and what they realized is that uh, typically they would use, they would choose, uh, say, an additive to a polymer package because it was legal and it worked and the price was good. But they really didn't consider um, the a green screen benchmark score. Um, and now they can. And they off, they're finding that sometimes they have perfectly viable options with uh, better hazard profiles. And now that they have a tool to do this, they are using it. And I love this simple quote by Jonathan Pusco, who just said, the more you know about what you're putting into your products, the more likely you are to make better choices in product development. And I think that, in my mind, captures the value of, of this method. Next. Uh, we're seeing the green screen built into corporate policies. Staples has built it into their chemicals policy. And it's also built into the Biz NGO Guide to Safer Chemicals. And Biz NGO is another flagship project of uh, clean production action. It's a collaboration between NGOs and businesses uh, and uh, coming up with safe, uh, chemical policies and a roadmap and uh, principles for sustainable plastics and all sorts of interesting things. And we're having a meeting on December 3rd and 4th in uh, in uh, California, if anyone's interested, check out the Biz NGO website. Next. Um, we're seeing a uh, green screen built into uh, or cited in state regulations. It's been cited as a viable tool to find alternatives to chemicals of concern in children's products in Maine and Washington. It's included in the uh, development of the multi-state guidance for how to do alternatives assessment that's um, in development. And we think it will be a viable tool to use with, uh, to comply with California's safer consumer products regulation. We know that, as I mentioned before, it's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, that regulation also calls for looking at life cycle impacts, social impacts, economic, et cetera. Next. Uh, right now, it is also uh, being used in the lead as a proposed uh, building product disclosure and optimization credits. And um, it's used two ways. One, it asks you to identify and disclose known chemicals of concern for 20 permanently installed products using the green screen list translator. And I'll speak about that in just a moment. And it, um, or another credit is, which applies to 25% by cost of permanently installed products. You have two options. One is to identify products that don't contain any benchmark one chemicals, according to the list translator, and to identify products that contain only benchmark two or higher chemicals. And that needs a full green screen. So it's, uh, I don't know if it will, uh, will uh, make it into the final credit, but final standard, but it's there now. And uh, comments are welcome uh, till December 2nd, I think. Next. So what is the green screen list translator? I'll just do this very quickly. But the list translator is a portion of the green screen. It's not a full green screen. It's just the portion that takes all of those green screen specified lists that I showed you in the cute mammalian toxicity criteria. And, and there are lists for the other criteria as well, in most cases. And it translates them into green screen hazard criteria. So if something is on a known carcinogen hazard list, that can translate to the cancer endpoint, which translate, which can be translated to high, medium, low, which can, give, can be used in the benchmarking scoring system. Next. So uh, again, you can see in this example that you can take things like H phrases, H statements, and R phrases, and uh, specific lists that have been published and use them to help classify chemicals. Next slide. Um, the, we have something we actually call the list translator that's on the website. But I think it's better to look at the green screen hazard criteria, because then you can see how every list lines up 
with the hazard endpoint and which classifications it covers. But what happened is that we were, um, we have two partners in this. One is Pharos, which is a program of Healthy Building Network, and the other is, is the Works and their tool Greenworks. And they both were interested in building the list translator into their software tools. Next slide. So Pharos, uh, most people think of Pharos as evaluating building materials, which it does. But it also has a less known functionality in their chemical library where you can actually just look up a single uh, CAS number, a chemical abstract service number. And it will tell you all of the lists that uh, are flagged. And these lists, uh, for the most part, are all of the lists in the Green Screen List Translator. There are a couple that are still uh, being integrated, but it gives you a nice, um, a nice. Uh, it's a it's a very inexpensive tool. I think it's about $180 a year, and allows you to search um, thousands of chemicals this way. Next one. The list translator in GreenWorks has a lot of really nice uh, bells and whistles. You can add um, any number of chemicals, and you can press the analyze button and it'll search all 450 sources, and it'll actually populate this hazard table for you in about two seconds. Uh, next slide. And if you click on any one of, oops, if you could go back, yeah, any one of those boxes, it tells you which lists that chemical is on. So in this case, ethylbenzene, I think it's ethylbenzene here, um, was, um, uh, it's a considered a carcinogen. It's an authoritative list. And the bolded list is the one that's used for the classification. And there's a, a ranking system. So authoritative lists trump, trump screening lists. And if two lists have the same authority, then um, the more conservative value gets listed. But you can see here um, all the sources that classified this chemical as a carcinogen. And they don't always give the same results. So, so the list translator is great, but you still, you're, you know, it gives you a very good initial sense. But wherever there's a blank, that means there are no lists for that chemical or that chemical's not on those lists. So it just tells you what's known. And typically what's known are, are aspects of concern. Next slide. So um, that pretty much wraps up my talk. Um, the way to do a green screen assessment, you can do it yourself. Um, the method's freely available and transparent. Training is available. Uh, we are launching a program. And if anyone's interested, I'd love to talk with you. It's, we're calling it the Green Screen Certified Industry Practitioner Program. And what it will do is train people in industry and potentially government, too, how to use the method. And we are setting up a coaching program so that you do two assessments and you would get coached in it because you really learn it by doing it. And then. Um, we, are, we host trainings. The next training is November 15th in Chicago at the Catching the Wave, uh, right after the Catching the Wave conference. So we recommend that if you can, go to the Catching the Wave Conf Green Chemistry Conference and then uh, a day-long green screen training. And this training is subsidized by the GLRI, uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So it's very inexpensive. It pretty much just covers food. And you'll see Teresa and me and others. Then there's another training. I think it's Jan January 24th in Minneapolis. Um, another way to, to do green screen is to hire a licensed green screen profiler. And um, the, currently, the two licensed green screen profilers are Talk Services and NSF International. So Teresa's organization can uh, do them also. You can um, use the list translator. Um, you could access it through Pharos, or you could access it through Greenworks. Greenworks is a lot more expensive, but as I said, it comes with a lot of bells and whistles and the whole Greenworks system. But Pharos is, well, is a great tool also. Um, one thing you might do in industry is consider um, if there are chemicals of interest to your industry, uh, getting together with other companies and tipping in to assess and share the assessments the GC3, Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, did that. They've evaluated nine plasticizers as a group, and they're sharing those assessments um, together. And then down the road, we're looking to create a database where green screen assessments can be held. And right now, we're uh, working with Green Blue as they develop their MIQ database, because 
um, we think it would be valuable to have a place where assessments of uh, chemicals and or materials uh, can be held. So that's pretty much all I have to say. And thank you. I'll turn it over to Teresa and Corey. All right. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, yeah, that was um, that was certainly a, a brief overview of, of the green screen, and um, it's a lot of information to to take in all at once. Um, so the, I do, um, if you're interested in more in-depth um, in-depth look at the green screen, I encourage you to go to those trainings. They are quite a quite a value um, for a day-long training, and and you'll get a lot uh, an opportunity to practice doing the green screen um, um, in, during the session. So um, they, they are excellent, excellent training courses. Um, all right, so on to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Corey Robertson is a environmental chemist at Hewlett Packard. And he, um, and in that position, he applied the principles of, of green chemistry to evaluate and select alternatives to restricted substances. And Corey uses tools such as the green screen um, and life cycle assessments to promote continuous improvement in the environmental and human health attributes of the materials that are used in HP supply chain. And prior to his current position, Corey worked as an analytical chemist in HP's material science lab for 10 years. He holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Boise State University and a master's degree in environmental science and policy from, and management from the University of Denver. Um, so I will turn it over then to Corey. All right, great. Thank you, Teresa. And thanks, uh, Cindy and Angela, for, for setting this up. And, and Thanks to Lauren for doing all the heavy lifting and uh, the first part of the presentation here. So hopefully you can see my my screen here. Uh, go right into it. So I thought I would go, you know, a little bit into why why we're so interested in the green screen, and you know, it kind of all started with Ross. Uh, so that's the restriction of hazardous substances legislation in the EU that came out in 2006. Of course, there was a lot of <clears throat> work. Excuse me. Um, that went into uh, preparing for the, that legislation, you know, before 2006, but uh, that's when it actually took effect. <clears throat> and it uh, restricts the use of, of these six substances. Uh, lead was a, a kind of a major one for the electronics industry to, um, to handle, and you know, an important uh, consideration, I guess, of the Ross legislation is kind of what was driving um, them to restrict these substances, and it, it came from the the waste uh, electronic uh, waste electrical and electronic equipment directive. So you know it's it's being driven by looking at the end of life of um, electronics products, not just you know necessarily how they're made or how they're used, but also the end of life. And so that's um, kind of an important uh, aspect of this legislation. But um, as, as we look at uh, substance restrictions, are becoming more and more kind of a major part of um, the regulations that electronics manufacturers have to have to uh, face, and there's more substances, more jurisdictions, more reporting um, all the time. And he, the graph on the right is a little bit hard to to see, but you can just generally see the trend is upward. And in terms of you know how many regulations are uh, you know being uh, used in the electronics industry and um, what the electronics industry is facing. Um, so the bottom line, kind of literally, is that uh, HP wants to use materials that no one cares about. So you know, we want to find materials that um, will not be restricted in the future, and we want to kind of point our suppliers to thinking in that way. You know, they want we want them to go out. You know, when they're designing materials that will be used in HP products, we want them to uh, think about the environmental aspects of of those materials and and choose uh, materials that um, will fly under the radar, I guess, of the restrictions. So, how do we go about um, doing, you know, implementing substance restrictions? And so, HP's at, been at this for quite some time. You can see this is our um, proactive materials restriction list. So, in the early '90s, we started uh, restricting some materials, um, and then, you know, the list. It's bigger and bigger as time has gone on. And 
so that's one of the, the issues with creating a restricted substance list is they just get very long and very hard to manage and, and uh, up and down the, the supply chain um, it's hard to manage those long lists and our, our suppliers have difficulty looking through all of those uh, substances and the other part of it is that most suppliers uh, treat any unregulated substitute as you know uh, an equally good replacement and the truth is that some some replacements will be good and some replacements will be bad and so we want to have our suppliers look for the materials that that are better um, in terms of uh, human health and the environment so uh, another reason um, you know HP is a business and we're always interested in uh, you know saving money and um, these transition costs are pretty high so uh, look you know thinking about the, the Ross transition you know there's estimates that the, that transition in the industry is in you know the millions and possibly the hundreds of millions of dollars to get rid of some of those uh, materials industry-wide so it, it is a big cost and so you can think about it in terms of if you're replacing a, a substance of concern such as DHP which is a, a phthalate that's um, uh, on some people's uh, uh, restricted list um, but you could switch to to another phthalate and then find out that that's restricted some date in the future and switch to another phthalate and then eventually get to a non uh, you know a non phthalate that really is the safer alternative. Um, you can try to set some guidelines to get it uh, so that you only have one transition. But what would be best would be to establish some conditions that uh, promote the the best alternative kind of directly so that you only transition once. That way you can save money as a as a company. And so that brings up the question, you know, how do you evaluate these alternatives? And are the alternatives better? So um, when we were looking at different uh, tools that could be used to evaluate alternatives, uh, the green screen kind of rose to the top as the one that, um, that we like the best. Um, and, you know, there were several reasons, but I'll give you a couple of reasons. Uh, probably you know, one of the most important is that it aligns with the regulators. As Lauren showed, um, it was based off of the EPA Design for Environment group, so they took this hazard table that Lauren showed. This was for the um, flame retardant alternatives for printed circuit boards project that the EPA did several years ago. And so um, we, we want to predict um, which materials are going to be restricted in the future, and so to do that you need to think like a regulator and so um, you know it would be great if the regulators would say uh, we're gonna restrict this restrict this substance in the year 2018 and and then we can plan for that and that'd be great but unfortunately that's not the way it works we usually find out which materials would be restricted in you know a fairly short order and there's a lot of work that has to be done to transition away from those uh, materials so in order to save time and money we need to uh, have a system in place that that um, that uh, uses kind of the same thinking that the regulators use to establish which materials are the safer or which ones are the better alternatives so alignment with the regulators is an important strength the other one is the simplicity of the of the output so the green screen benchmark system so just a little illustration of that so um, We'd like a system that you know almost anyone with NHP could you know, understand that which alternatives are better. And so procurement is very good with numbers. So uh, if they choose materials that are less expensive, that's good for them. Uh, but when they are faced with environmental criteria, it's a little less clear which options are better. And especially if you look at chemical information, deciding between something that's uh, got aquatic toxicity and bioaccumulation versus another chemical that's persistent and mutagenic. Um, you know they're not; they don't have the skills to to make those kinds of evaluations. So you need uh, a simpler way to depict which which alternatives are better. And so, uh, if you attach a benchmark score to one, you can see that it's pretty easy to pick if they're the same price, <laughs> um, the material that's the, the better option. So simplicity was an important part of why we picked the, the green screen. So how do we actually use it in HP? So one way is just to generate lists um, of, 
assessments based on similar function. Uh, so this could be a list of flame retardants. It could be a list of plasticizers. Uh, but we'd show the, the benchmark ones at the bottom in the do not use category, and benchmark two up, and then the green benchmark four are the preferred materials. And so this, our design engineers can look at these lists and, and see which flame retardants they're currently using and see if there are alternatives that could be better. And so, uh, you know, they can use that internally within HP. And then uh, kind of along those same lines, as Lauren mentioned, ZC3, the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, is, is using this kind of same approach to look at plasticizers. Um, and this would be more of a public uh, forum. And so they would have this list of plasticizers with different benchmark scores. And so then the industry can kind of quickly and easily see. And so we're really, you know, excited about that project. We'd like to see that um, come to fruition. And so it, it gets to the idea of having a white list. So um, uh, the NGOs and regulators that we um, work with in the electronics industry are you know, pretty good at putting out blacklists, so the materials that you shouldn't use in your products. And what we'd like to have are, are white lists. So these are the alternatives that should be used in their place or um, materials that are you know, recommended as better alternatives. So we'd like to see more white lists. Another way that we use it is just in our case plastic database. So this would be the external skin of uh, a PC or a printer. Um, so they're looking at different materials that could be used. And a big part of that is uh, trying to find materials that meet certain eco-label criteria so that they can get into certain markets. And so um, they'll look at the different plastics that are used and see if they meet that criteria. And then we can add this column uh, with the green screen value so they can kind of quickly and easily see which materials are the better alternatives. And so it kind of all gets in, you know, at this, uh, at a high level into the integrated alternatives assessment uh, procedure. So um, if I could just step through it real quickly. So you identify a, a chemical of concern, you'd look at the use and function. So usually the, the chemical of concern is given to us by someone, by a regulator. So, you know, so-and-so is looking at this material, uh, possibly restricting this material. What are some of the alternatives? And so we use the green screen to deselect the, the options are, that are not less hazardous. So only the less hazardous options would pass on to uh, the deeper analysis. And so we, we have this parking lot of deselected options that, um, through the green screen process. So these could be benchmark ones, for instance. So we would deselect all the benchmark ones. They would go into a parking lot. Benchmark twos and hires would go down through to the, to the technical economic assessment, the LCA exposure assessment as needed. And then we would uh, hopefully select more than one alternative so that our suppliers would have multiple options to choose from. Um, and then an important uh, pilot project that we have undertaken is the PVC free power cord project. So uh, as many of you know, PVC is being phased out uh, voluntary and a voluntarily in a lot of applications. Um, and when we're looking at the PVC free alternatives, we've, as a company, have decided to require the green screen uh, in addition to all the standard regulatory requirements that we required of a, of a power cord. Um, we're also requiring the green screen. And so that involves getting full dis disclosure of all the ingredients in the formulation, which is, um, as I'll discuss in a minute, uh, a project unto itself. <laughs> and uh, along with that, we had some supplier training. This was a couple of years ago that we brought in some cable manufacturers and uh, trained them actually on the green screen and how to use it. Um, and through that whole process, we've created an approved materials list. So we have a list of manufacturers and resins that can be used in HP, HP's PVC-free power cords. And so only those materials can be used. Um, so what have we learned from this whole process? So what, you know, what's changed? One thing is that by talking directly to our formulators, so HP has a very complicated and uh, large uh, supply chain. And so uh, we're not necessarily talking to, you know, the, the person that actually manufactures the cable. We're going another step back to 
the actual resin manufacturers who we wouldn't normally uh, deal with directly. And so we're communicating our environmental requirements farther up the supply chain. And so that's, you know, if we articulate what we're looking for, um, we get better materials. Um, and then as I talked about, you know, confidential business information was uh, kind of a big part of this, the pilot project. Um, so, you know, one benefit that we've gotten out of this is that we know a lot more about the materials that are used in our products. Um, and, you know, it usually requires a confidentiality agreement. And the suppliers have commented that they, you know, they may supply this information to a company like HP that they trust, but they wouldn't necessarily support by the same information to uh, either smaller manufacturers or a possible competitor um, where you know their competitors could be involved in some way. So uh, it is kind of a tricky situation. So ideally, we'd like to have it handled in a, a third party situation where, where HP doesn't need to see all of the details of the formulation, uh, but it would be evaluated by a third party. And they could verify the green screen scores, and HP wouldn't have to get involved. We would just look at the final scores. So we're definitely not, not at that point yet, but um, that's where we'd like to get to someday. And a lot of that confidential information is material dependent. So you can see this is just taken from an MSDS for, for a battery. And there's a lot of information that basically shows everything that's in the battery. And so there's the, pretty much full material disclosure there. But in a polymer, it's much more close to the vest, I guess. Uh, they don't list their ingredients uh, in any detail. And you know, in, in this particular one, 99% of the formulation is, is unknown uh, based on the MSDS information. So you do have to dig pretty deep uh, for polymer information. So what, what kind of feedback have we gotten? Um, so from a, a polymer formulator said this, maybe we should pre-screen our materials before we send you our formulations. So this was kind of a key thing that we wanted to communicate to our, our suppliers that we're looking for different materials. And so it, this was kind of one of those aha moment, moments where they said, you know, we, you know, we said, yes, they're getting it. You know, uh, They're looking at their materials before they send us the formulations. And another one is, you know, our customers are asking about HP's requirements. So we're getting to the flame retardant supplier, not just HP's direct supplier, but further up the supply chain. This a flame retardant supplier has recognized that, you know, HP is asking for something um, over and above what we're usually uh, used to supplying. Uh, some of the surprise, surprises that we've come across, um, uh, many suppliers have, have similar frameworks not necessarily the green screen, but something similar that they use internally. So they're somewhat familiar with uh, looking at alternatives. Um, and probably the biggest one is the suppliers have additional toxicology data that isn't publicly available. I think we all kind of uh, probably had some idea that that was true. But we've definitely come across that if, you know, if we uh, ask for a green screen formulation and it comes back, it looks like a benchmark one. They may come back and say, "Well, we have more data to show that uh, you know they have test data or something that shows that um, a certain endpoint would is actually a low instead of a high or something." And so they do have additional information. And another surprise was just asking for uh, the suppliers to actually do the assessments. So we'd get a list of the formulation, and we'd say, "We you know we already have." assessments on these materials? Can you do assessments on these materials? And they may actually remove those chemicals from the formulation. So uh, apparently they, they weren't important to the formulation to begin with. And, and so it was uh, somewhat of a surprise that they would, uh, just by asking to do an assessment, they would actually take those chemicals out. So just some uh, concluding thoughts. You know, the electronics industry is kind of a unique opportunity because our, our products turn over relatively quickly. Um, and just to give you some idea of the scale, so uh, HP shipped 52 million printers and 64 million PCs in, in 2010. And so for this hour-long webinar, that's 14,400 PCs and printers. So there's quite a lot going out every day. And so there's lots of materials decisions that are made uh, every day within you know, a company of this size. And 
so we want to get involved in that and, and help the help our engineers to make better choices. And some of you may, with small children, may recognize Dr. Doofenshmirtz, but um, I just wanted to say, you know, it's a great time to be a chemist. We're having engineers come to us. You know, it's not all just about the physical properties anymore, you know, tensile strength and Nizot impact, um, but it's about incorporating the environmental attributes um, that may be involved, not just at the substance level, but uh, even at the resin level as well. So, you know, should we use PCABS instead of polyethylene or vice versa? And we think the green screen that can help. And, uh, and that's all we have for today. Thanks. We'll turn it over for questions. Great. We have several questions that have come up. Uh, the first question is, is there, any, uh, is there an EU equivalent for green screen? Uh, this is Lauren. Um, I would say no. Um, there are some tools. Uh, there's the column model and um, another one, but I can't remember what it's called. It's that that is more. I would say it's more like the list translator. It it deals with uh, risk phrases and hazard phrases primarily, but. Uh, as far as I know, we have not run into any kind of comprehensive system for classifying and benchmarking chemicals. Um, of course, you could say that the GHS is a global system for hazard classification, and that's global, uh, but it doesn't go into benchmarking. And Lauren, Lauren, this is Teresa. I just wanted to add that um, the green screen tool certainly incorporates um, uh, lists and um, risk phrases that are used in in Europe. Um, so the 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 method itself would um, certainly be relevant um, and and use use the the classification codes that are um, that are used in Europe. So I think it it, yes. it reaches across quite nicely. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and just to add to that, uh, yeah, we'd like to see the green screen used, you know, internationally. Um, because you know we're familiar with it, we think it applies to a lot of different um, areas, and you know as we said, it incorporates all of the European guidelines. So I think that uh, uh, you know that one having one system internationally would be great. And uh, Lauren's actually been working with some of the eco label uh, groups in Europe to to uh, discuss how the green screen could be involved in their eco label criteria in Europe. So. Mm -hmm. And this question is kind of a follow-up to that. Which standards include the green screen in them? OK. Um, currently, the green screen is proposed um, in the version 4 of the US Green Building Council LEED standard. And that's currently open for public comment. Um, we are working on a mutual recognition program with the Cradle to Cradle standard with uh, MBDC and that is that would the way that would work is if someone had a green screen assessment on uh, chemicals in a product they could take those assessments to say MBDC or the Cradle to Cradle Institute and use them towards uh, certification so you wouldn't have to redo the hazard assessment piece and then it's being um, it's being explored as I said it's in some uh, state regulations, it's being explored in an organic wine standard and um, and also in, as Corey mentioned, in the um, some electronics standards, but it's not officially in them at this time. It's being explored, so how it might be used as either a normative reference or a tool for identifying safer alternatives as part of the standard. Great. Um, the next question is a more technical one. Um, how do you address the independence of values, i.e., are these classifications informing each other? Could it be the case that all classifications were based on the same data? Is that acknowledged anywhere in the table? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I guess I'll take a crack at that, and then Corey, if you want to, too. Um, I think that does happen, um, especially with some of the 
carcinogenicity classifications, you get uh, maybe uh, state lists um, adopting information from federal lists. And um, I don't know how much crossover you always get between countries, but I do think you see that in some cases. But in the full green screen assessment, um, data trump uh, models and uh, for the most part lists until unless they're clearly um, uh, authoritative government lists. Um, so uh, you would be searching the literature for new information to make your classification. But I do think in the case of certain say, cancer classifications, those are considered authoritative, robust, longstanding, um, hammered out, and they do get carried into other, other systems. But on the other hand, um, uh, seven countries now have uh, created uh, GHS classification lists of chemicals. So Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Europe, so New Zealand, Australia. Um, and so what they have done is evaluated a whole bunch of chemicals using GHS and providing those classifications uh, for their country. And even though it's called the globally harmonized system, it's not always harmonized. And they tend to differ a little bit. So you actually do see differences between countries. So they're not usually huge differences. One might say it's a 1A and one might say it's a 1B. Because this is, you know, toxicological sciences um, takes judgment and, you know, the best available information. So I think in that sense, you don't see a lot of carryover. You see countries making their own classifications based on the best available science that they have. Corey, did I miss anything? Yeah. Would you have yeah, anything so I guess just to add to that, so you know, I think the beauty of the green screen is that you look at all of the data that's available and use you know the best data that's available, or uh, look at the more conservative uh, classifications um, in some cases. But you know, all the time looking at what's the best data that's available and making a conclusion. So it does take some kind of technical expertise to actually do the assessment. Uh, but yeah, the beauty of it is once that technical part is done then you have a, a benchmark score that's simple and easy for anyone to understand. Uh, so there would be some duplication, I'm sure, of classification data uh, in there. But you know, someone's got to look at that and decide you know, what is the endpoint that you know, truly applies to this chemical. Great. Thank you. We actually are out of time for questions. Okay. Well, uh, this is Teresa. I will wrap up the webinar in that case. Um, so thank you so much for um, to Lauren and to Corey. Um, I think um, you know it's, it's inspiring to hear a success story. To to hear how how green screen has been successful in, in, within HP, and I hope the attendees um, you know can find this find this webinar useful and find it inspiring for their own for their own work. Um, and thank you to all of the attendees for uh, participating in the webinar. And I hope you continue to um, participate in our in our upcoming webinar series. Um, just wanted to point out a couple of upcoming events. Um, the uh, there is a conference in November, the Green Chemistry um, and Economic Development Conference, um, also known as the the Catching the Wave Conference in Chicago. Um, and, and, and directly following that is the green screen training, um, which um, Lauren, Corey, and I will be attending and participating in the teaching team there. Um, then in January, there is a, another green screen training in conjunction with the Minnesota Green Chemistry Conference in, in my hometown. Um, in Minnesota, well, I'm actually in St. Paul, but in, right next door in Minneapolis. Um, and so I encourage you to uh, Midwestern folks to attend that that conference and training as well. Like we said, the green screen training is is a very affordable and excellent way to get introduced uh, more deeply to the the training. So I encourage you all to attend that as well. Um, and and. Um, just to close out the conference, um, I encourage uh, you again. Do, do Angela, do we have a slide on back on the P two the challenge? 
and it doesn't. Okay. Oh, back there. Great. Um, so, just a reminder. Um, this is this is webinar series was sponsored by the Safer Chemistry Challenge Program, um, and I do encourage you all to 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 sign up uh, for the challenge and participate. It's an excellent opportunity um, to to um, um, get recognized for your efforts in this area. So, if you have any any questions. Um, you can contact us at saferchemistry um, at gmail.com or um, our contact information is at the website on the slide as well. So thank you all um, and we'll, we'll uh, talk to you at the next uh, webinar.